Welcome to Bronx Talk. A week ago, there was a devastating magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Taiwan, much closer to home, as you well know. Near Tewksbury, New Jersey, there was a 4.8 level earthquake that was felt by many here in the Bronx and throughout New York City. And there have been aftershocks as well. So here's a question. Did you know that a seismic observatory that is one of the oldest in the United States is right here in the Bronx, 30 feet below the Earth's surface, where? At Fordham University. In fact, the William Spain Seismic Observatory has been measuring earthquakes for more than a century, and this is its hundredth year. And so with us tonight is the professor who heads that unique facility to talk about the earthquake we just had, the prospects for aftershocks, and other related issues. He's also been studying the air quality in the Bronx, which has been a problem here for generations, as you well know. So to talk about the earth and sky, please join us in welcoming an associate professor of physics, engineering, excuse me, of physics and engineering physics at Fordham University. It is Professor Stephen Holler. Nice to see you, sir. Thank you, Gary. Nice to be um, here. Let, let's just talk about, uh, before we talk about the seismic events themselves, uh, let's talk about the William Spain Seismic Observatory at Fordham University. Give us a little bit of its illustrious history and how we got to where we are today, where we really needed it just a week ago. Um, the building has actually been on campus for uh, just about 100 years, the, the actual building itself. Um, it was a donation um, in the honor of William Spain, who was a student uh, who died in 1922, I believe, and his father donated uh, the, the resources for the Seismic Observatory. Uh, it's been on campus since 1924. It's moved around a couple times. Um, first spot was deemed to be undesirable. Um, so about a year after it was built, it was moved uh, if you're familiar with the clock tower and Keating Hall, um, you can see that off campus. Uh, that is where it, it, it stood until they decided that uh, they wanted a clock tower on campus. And so they said, okay. So, they so evicted, then they moved it. They right? evicted the seismic station <laughs> and they moved it uh, to where its present location but, is. But of course, if they moved it, that meant they had to dig down. They right? had to dig another we, hole, yes. We have some photos. Let's look at photos so people can see sure. exactly what it is, which is uh, pretty exciting. That is... I guess an older picture from uh, the outside of the... Yeah, that is facility. actually the station being moved. Uh, you can see oh. that it's up on, uh, up on those, uh, that sled, and uh, there's oh, one, of the Jesuit, one of the Jesuit priests there is actually and, and then, So they had to go and dig down. It's about 30 feet is what yeah. I understand. Yeah, there's a big vault under, under. down below. Let's, let's just see some more. Some, uh, so he, here's what, uh, what's going on. Here. Yeah, that's, ju that's, the, that's the interior of the structure, that building. Um, and uh, ironically, the, uh, the vault is not even under the building. The stairs are there, and the stairs go down into another vault that is just behind it that is right. a large room about 30 feet underground. And here, here's a look at the equipment. Um, this is what it looks like today? Or this is... Uh, recently? Yeah, this is, this is recent, um, probably about a year old, this photo. Uh, that is the old equipment that uh, we don't use but are ah. great for demonstrations. Um, because we can show off what, uh, what the equipment, how it works. And we talk to our students about the physical principles that, uh, that are, enable us to make the measurements. Um, right. But that is the actual instrument that, that we use. That is, it, it's, it's so quaint. It's yes, like, it's it's like a, a little shoebox with, with something in it. it yeah. It's a needle. Is that what it is? It's a needle that moves? There's um, not quite a needle, but there's some microelectronics inside that can that do the same thing that all of those other instruments on the table 
the can itself is only maybe 18 yeah, inches tall like and six inches in diameter. And, and so if something rumbles in the earth, anywhere in the world? Anywhere in the world. That little canister feels that that little canister will feel it. Those, it's amazing. Those slabs that are that it's sitting on are, are connected up to the bedrock. We're fortunate in the Bronx that the that rock that bedrock that we want to be in contact with is very close to the surface. You see a lot of this if you go by the botanical gardens. You go in the Bronx Zoo. You'll see all right. those large rocks coming up out of the out of the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that uh, those rocks are basically surface down to 20 feet or so, 30 feet. Do, does the thing move all the time or really does it only move when there's like a real seismic event like the one in Taiwan? And um, one we, in we monitor events. Um, so whenever there is an event in somewhere in the world that is sufficiently large, we don't see all of the events around the world. Right. Um, we'll see things, sevens or six sevens are very easy for us to see, uh, depending on how far away uh, a four or a five may. Uh, is, is somebody sitting there all the time? Because obviously an earthquake can happen at all the time, or <laughs> you get an alert, you know, like, uh, hello, uh, professor, ho holler, uh, we've got something going. For, fortunately, we're past those days of somebody having to constantly you monitor. Okay. Um, Father Lynch monitored the station for, uh, for decades. Um, he was, uh, overseeing the station uh, in the late 1920s, early 30s uh, is when he started. Uh, and then he was basically monitoring it for about 50 years or so or so, into wow. the 80s. Um, and so I know I talked to alumni. Um, we have one alumni who was who was back recently and he graduated in the 60s. And uh, he told me I got I learned a little bit about uh, Father Lynch's setup. He had alarms that were set off in his uh, in his residence um, on campus, in his classroom and in his office. Wow. And so that if something happened, he would be able to go. It. But those were the days uh, of the paper. And yeah, the, uh, I was going to say, just get him a cell phone. We can clear <laughs> that up in a second. How rare was the one that we had in New Jersey? Uh, a relatively light 4.8 magnitude earthquake. Um, it was felt across the New York metro area. I actually didn't feel it. I was uh, actually on the phone in a phone meeting at the time. And then all of a sudden I heard about, you know, people saying it after the after the fact. Um, so how, how rare is it? And where were you at the time? Everybody say where I was at the time. I, I didn't feel it either. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I was uh, I was driving to campus uh, that morning. Um, and the only reason I knew about it is my daughter had sent me a message and said, hey, was that an earthquake? You better get to work. You know, was that an earthquake? And then uh, about five minutes later, my phone blew up with text messages and phone calls from everybody asking about the earthquake. Um, it was it was a moderate earthquake. It was people on the West Coast will say, oh, well, you know, that wasn't that bad. Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are you worried about? <laughs> and um, uh, but it was it was significant for the East Coast. We don't get those uh, those magnitudes uh, too often. Um, well, we're fairly uh, stable out here. Uh, I'll tell you what the United States uh, Geological Society since 1957 has logged earthquakes with a magnitude of 2.5 within a 250 mile radius of New York City uh, since 1957. 188 earthquakes of a magnitude of 2.5. We haven't had one like that here in this area for a long time for a long time yeah no it's been it's been a while what i've noticed is that every seems like every five or six years somewhere on the east coast there is a tremor that is maybe around four um i think there was one in delaware uh, about five mm -hmm. or six years ago maybe seven years ago and another one there was the one in uh, virginia in 2011 that was in the fives. I remember one, and goodness, it had to be in the 90s or something. I was in an apartment and I lived uh, in an upper floor, and the walls shook, and it was like, and then of course the news reported that that there was something. Um, now that we've seen it, and this I'm sure many people are thinking about, well, like have we opened the floodgates, and now all of a sudden we should be? How concerned are you about? New York City and the New York metro area. I'm, I'm not concerned at all. Not, con well, not concerned. He's not concerned. <laughs> that's, that's like your doctor telling you you don't have cancer. Yeah, no, I, I think we're okay. Um, you know, what happens is that the, the stresses build up in, the, in the, the fault lines. And every so often they got to blow off some steam. And they, 
you know. what, what causes those stresses? I mean, well, jumping up and down or something <laughs> like that? Um, the, uh, we sit on, on all these plates that move around the Earth, right? The, there's the, the, the tectonic plates. Um, we, you know, there's a relatively new theory um, <clears throat> that really got confirmation in the, uh, in the 20th century, mid 20th century. So it's not even that long ago. Um, <clears throat> that we really said, okay, yes, this is it. And so the plates kind of move around on the earth and they butt up against each other. Uh, we don't live near a plate boundary. Uh, like, or a fault line? Is uh, a fault? Well, there are fault lines around. Um, mm -hmm. There are fault lines. I believe there's one that actually runs uh, through Harlem um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Manhattan. There are some other ones as well. Uh, the one that, that uh, released its energy last week was uh, the Ramapo fault line. In New Jersey, and so these are old fault lines. The rock is fairly stable, but there is some pressure that builds up. And why why has New York um, not had them as as often as let's say California? We're not on uh, California is near a plate boundary, <clears throat> so you have the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate are are kind of moving uh, moving against each around. other. So um, they're actually butting up against each other. We're we haven't had that kind of activity in millennia um <clears throat> it's been a really long time we have you you provided us with the the, the actual graph this is uh, what it looks like so this is the actual uh, that was the event that, that happened. was the event that was the event it was about 20 seconds long i think um <clears throat> and um <laughs> and there it is but then it leveled out and it leveled out right and what you're seeing here is actually um we detect motion that that sensor just doesn't you know wobble when this thing comes in it's it's on that slab it's connected but and, it then, can, and then like a needle moves yeah and it, you can think of it that way um, okay. <laughs> and um what happens is it looks at the motion but what you're seeing here is motion in uh the east east west direction north south direction and uh the vertical motion and I so, see. It can so actually, that's the different that's the um, different graphs. graphs that you're seeing so it partitions that motion into uh oh. That, that signal that comes in into the three different uh, axes. Well, so, so that was an event that, that uh, needed to be noticed. Now, the next graph that we have is aftershock. Yes. So let's talk. So now these are obviously much smaller. These are much smaller. I, I made them on the same scale so you could see uh, the relative difference between the two events. Right. The, the principal earthquake, the, right, the thing that happened at 1030 in the morning, uh, was uh, was a four, magnitude 4.8. And the largest of the aftershocks that we felt uh, was a magnitude 3.8. So it's a, a small difference, you would say, right? Mm -hmm. It goes from, from 4.8 to 3.8, but that's a factor of 10 because of the, uh, the logarithmic scale that we measure right. these on. Uh, there was a, it, I wasn't planning to spend a lot of time on this. There was an op-ed piece in the Times that said maybe we have to update our, um, our measuring system for this. Uh, do you agree with that, or is this really sufficient for what we need? Um, I, I think there, there could be arguments for, for updating for, for it as well. Just about anything. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, I mean, we talk about updating the measurement scales for a lot of different things. And, and what about prospects for aftershocks? Uh, there, that one that you saw was actually the 12th aftershock really? of the day. Uh, there were a bunch of others during the day. They were just too small for us to feel. So it's, it's like, yeah, all right, so you have this event, right? And then it kind of takes a while to slow down, and that's what those aftershocks are? Right. Well, this, this event happened, and it, it, it was, a, it was a, a slipping of the rocks between the faults. They released some, some energy, and that might have disturbed some other uh, events and other, other areas on the fault that those, uh, those rocks started moving against each other. Uh, and the earth is just basically settling down. Settling back. Well, um, uh, what are the uh, prospects for more aftershocks at this point? You, there, there you have don't been. seem concerned. No, I'm not. There, there have been aftershocks. There was one yesterday that was a, um, a 2.6 or so. Uh, it was very small. Can, can you predict them? Can you predict not no. only aftershocks? You can't. No. It's just the earth. I mean, they're going to happen. Aftershocks can happen. And, for... and even earthquakes will yeah. happen. Yeah. You know, there, you, there was no way for you or anybody to know this was going to happen. No, earthquake prediction is, uh, is, is not something that you know, we're very good at. That terrible one in um, Taiwan, um, the stories that came out after the fact were that they were well prepared. Their buildings have been 
uh, outfitted to the degree they can. I mean, some of the buildings actually fell but didn't collapse. I guess that would be an indication of it. A study that was done right afterwards of New York City said that we've built in uh, protections, infrastructure protections for, uh, uh, you know, earthquakes. Uh, New York City, I mean, obviously we know it's on bedrock. It's put one of the foundations of New York City, if you will. Um, so what, what, what do you think about um, the prospects for more? Once we've had one, are we going to get more of them? There, I mean, aftershocks will happen for, for days or weeks, um, even, even longer uh, after an event. They're generally a lot smaller in magnitude. So we don't, uh, we don't actually feel them. We uh, generally don't feel them. I have to ask you this, and when I asked you it on the phone before the show, you kind of giggled. <laughs> it's not connected to the solar eclipse? Absolutely not. It has nothing to do with it? Nothing to do with ne- it. There, there was actually an article in the Times that said, is it connected to the solar eclipse? A- everybody's asking that question, and it, it's not. Just, you know, we like to make connections with things. and Just a profound coincidence. Yes. Um, uh, is there anything that you, as a professional, you would recommend that New York City do or really um, certainly hope for the best? But no, I think we've been doing. Uh, I, was, uh, I was on a call with an engineer uh, on Friday and, you know, we, we were talking about the, the infrastructure. Um, we've built into the building codes. I think it's from 1996 or so, you know, to have these kind of protections. We also build our, our buildings for the weather that we deal with um so we we built in to the structure um provisions for high winds hurricanes what we're what we more typically see on the east coast uh and a lot of that uh, crosses over here's here's a, a a question that probably will elicit a different response from you what about climate change does this affect uh, you know what goes on below the earth i mean is this something that's kind of part of the whole climate change question no this is this is a not natural this is a natural natural event that's, that's under the happen. ground and not it doesn't matter whether you it, recycle your garbage or no it's not uh, it's not connected to climate change either um people might might try to argue with it um climate change is actually a thing um but this isn't part of it um so let's uh, i mean you you pretty much i think we've gone through everything about this is there anything else that i didn't ask you that you want to make sure the public knows about other than just informing them we saw the graph this is what happened you know it was it was an event it was a it it these things happen um they don't happen frequently happily <laughs> yeah happily <laughs> um and i i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't worry too much about right. it you you might feel some rumblings afterwards but uh it's uh, it's it's a small it's a small thing it's a natural thing wow okay i mean you know it's like going to the doctor he says don't worry (laughs) about it you'll be okay um i so now i want to ask you about the air uh and the sky uh this to me was fascinating just conceptually the fordham regional environmental sensor for healthy air is fresh fordham regional environmental sensor for healthy air is fresh air Um, Tell me about Project Fresh Air and why Fordham University and you, uh, especially in the Bronx, uh, has founded this project. So we, um, about four years ago, um, I guess now, uh, COVID has got us all thrown off on time. But just before the pandemic hit, we were... It's almost like you got to subtract two years from just about everything we do. Um, Exactly. Exactly. the uh, the university had decided, hey, we want to think about how are we, how can we reimagine higher education, and so we got together faculty, students, staff, administrators, uh, community organizers, got together, and we were kicking around these ideas for, you know, what are some daunting problems that uh, the university should be tackling, and how can we do it with the Bronx community. Because we exist in the Bronx because of the community basically allows us to, to reside in their, in their home. Have a good amount of property, and it's obviously been there for many, many years. Been there for a long time. Um, and uh, so we, we were looking at these daunting problems. One of them that we were looking at was climate change. And said, okay, how do we talk to the community about climate change? Um, this is not the number one priority for a lot of people in the Bronx. Um, many are not worried about the temperature change in 20 or 30 years. But what they are concerned about are the health of their, themselves and the health of their children. 
and air quality and uh, asthma rates are, uh, air quality spore asthma rates are very high in the Bronx. We uh, know this like we know our own names. Yes. Like the, we know what neighborhood we live in. Yeah, asthma rates in the Bronx are uh, the highest in the city. They're the highest in the state. I think about 25% of all asthma related deaths in New York State are from the Bronx. And so, in order to improve our air, air quality, we want to uh, reach out to the community and educate them about uh, about the about their environment. From a scientific point of view, but presumably that's where your angle is. Um, you can easily draw uh, maps to which neighborhoods are w affected worse. I mean, certainly in the South Bronx, we know what's been going on in Mott Haven for generations, but it's not exclusive to those spots. No, we know we know the areas that are that are the worst. It's um, some of the some of the worst pollution comes from the vehicular traffic. We have a lot of roadways that go through the Bronx, across Bronx, the Deegan, the Bruckner. Um, there's a lot of commercial traffic that Bronx comes in. Bronx River Parkway, the, Sawmill River they're, Parkway. They're keep all going. They, they, they're all over, um, and um, and and there are industrial areas. Look at uh, Hunts Point. There's a lot of commercial traffic that goes in. We have large tra tractor trailers that come in and small delivery vehicles that are going out. There's a lot of uh, uh, vehicular emissions that are contributing to uh, poor air quality and, uh, and high asthma rates. This is not something that Bronxites are hearing for the first time. I mean, we, we know that this is, is the case. So what are you doing? What, are we gonna, what, what does this project do to try and address it? I mean, so many of us and so many different forms of uh, Bronx life have, have tried and are still trying. <laughs> um, and what are you folks doing? We're trying. We, uh, we have these uh, air quality sensors. They, they measure particulate matter, um, pressure and temperature. So they where, where are they? Uh, we have been putting them in schools, middle schools and high schools around the Bronx. Um, and as part of the, the project, it's not just getting the location from the schools, right? I don't want to go into the school and say, I just need... Um, power and Wi-Fi, and and, and then, then I'll you put see them it. on the roof, or it's within uh, the building they're, itself. They're right outside the they're outside the building, and we do indoor uh, as well. And so we'll do wow. in, indoor and outdoor monitoring, um, and then we can compare the two. But we also want to get the students involved in the project, and uh, so that the students can become aware of their uh, their environment. So in addition to these commercial sensors that we we install and we track the data for that. Uh, we also um, have developed uh, little kits that we go out to the school uh, and the, we work with the, the teachers uh, at some of the schools to develop curricula uh, and integrate these into the classroom so the students are becoming aware of their, uh, of their community. They build these little um, sensor projects. They do some electronics, they do some wiring, they do a little bit of programming, and then they have this portable sensor that they can carry around. And, wow. Uh, how, how many schools do you do that? Uh, we've got, um, I was just looking at the number. For this project, I think there are uh, seven or eight in the Bronx right now, or okay. seven or eight sites that we have. And, and are they are they uh, distributed throughout different neighborhoods? Yes. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, so we're working with, um, I don't, can I talk about the school? I don't know if I can you, even you, name the you, schools. It's certainly fine. With um, me. People will relate to it. We have uh, Jonas Bronx Academy, uh, which is on Fordham and Webster Road. Mm -hmm. I have... Webster uh, Avenue. Um, yeah, sorry. Webster, Fordham Road and Webster. Um, uh, Grand Concourse, uh, Christ the King School okay. is there. All Hallows High School is further down. Um, we're in um, uh, St. So Ign Ignatius School over in... you can't in, remember all of them, but yeah. the point is but that they're, they're, really they're distributed around, around the Bronx. And is the curriculum a, you know, something that the schools can put in place like a full curriculum or is it kind of a one or two day lecture and maybe you or others come in? I want uh, parents and others to get a sense of it. And maybe there are some parents who'd like to know more about it. That would yeah, be interesting. Yeah, we, um, the largest curriculum development that we did was with Jonas Brown. I worked mm -hmm. with their, uh, their science team, their sixth, seventh and eighth grade science team. Uh, over over the summer a few years ago, and uh, we integrated into modules into all of those grades. I think it would be real interesting. You know, you mentioned six, seven, and eight, so that's middle school. In the old days, we called it junior high school. Um, but um, I, 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 I can understand the interest of a student who has asthma or who's been affected or who has a sibling who is affected by asthma, 
being incredibly interested to say, wait a minute, it's not a magic. This is where it actually comes from. Mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that, that even at that very hard age to, to uh, engage, uh, you're doing very well in, in those schools. Yeah, they, um, we've, we've done webinars with the, with the students and opened them up to, uh, open them up to the community. Uh, we bring in uh, outside speakers uh, who are experts in, in air quality in one way or another. It's either scientists, we have a doctor on there uh, on this one day, and uh, we, we inform them. And the whole idea is that we can inform them and get data and provide evidence. We know anecdotally that, uh, that these are, you know, everybody knows, oh yeah, the air in the Bronx is bad and I have a lot of asthma. But now we're hoping that we can uh, inform them with hard data and they can then leverage politicians to uh, improve. I have to say this really speaks so well of, of you and, and Fordham University because this is a central issue in uh, the borough of the Bronx. And goodness knows our kids have been staring at screens for two years, <laughs> getting them involved in something that relates directly to them, to their community, showing them something different. I, I, I have to give you a lot of credit. What, what are next steps in this? You're going to get more schools? I, I am always looking for more, more schools, more sites. Um, I have sites. I actually also have sites, a uh, couple in Manhattan, and, uh, and I'm moving out to other boroughs as well. But the Bronx is really where it started. Is, is the epicenter, unfortunately, of it. Um, do, does it come along? Now, you mentioned, you know, having people reach out to elected officials and others. I mean, there's budgetary considerations and all that. But there's also development considerations. Of course, now we've got the city of Yes that's, you know, floating around and, and being debated. Um, uh, are, are there other initiatives in, in the future that you'd recommend? Uh, we are. We actually do have a similar. Uh, I'm working with uh, the economics department as well uh, on uh, on a similar economics type, department at, in, at, at Fordham uh, on a similar project where we do have more schools um, that are all these are these are strictly with high schools, but we want to look at all this pollution data and correlate it with exam scores, and then and then we're working on that project with the New York Civil Liberties Union and a couple of environmental justice organizations to try that to push sense. legislation to um, make improvements. Um, do you um, have not have you been doing it enough time so that you can see a change, whether we're getting better or worse? Yeah. Or? Um, well, the New York City actually does their own um, monitoring. They have a right. number of sensors that they move around uh, throughout the year. Uh, and over the over the last decade or so that they've been doing this, um, maybe decade and a half, the you can see that the pollution has we, we're doing uh, better. Has in has right. e decrease. So. That's the, be the two good news. Number one, don't be overly worried about earthquakes. And number two, we're doing a little better with air quality. Uh, professor Stephen Holler, Associate Professor of Physics and Engineering Physics at Fordham University. Thank you so much. Thanks. You Thanks for having me. You really Gary. enlightened us to stuff that's the earth and the sky all around us. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we thank everybody, our producer, Rebecca Hemick, our director, Will Guzman, the editor of uh, Bronx Talkers, Jesse Diaz. We thank the thousands of uh, people who work for us in the studio. And if the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, you know, we'll be back next week. Good night.